Good morning, uh, or rather even good afternoon. Uh, uh, excuse me, I was just getting the pop-up about the meeting uh, off my screen. Well, welcome. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank uh, Landor for hosting this, uh, Genoptic for sponsoring it, our panelists for coming along and spending uh, their time, and also the audience yourselves for, for listening. Um, I re when I looked at this, uh, um, webinar, I reflected on the fact that uh, last October we held our annual conference and the theme of the conference was 2020 for the 2020s and it was really looking at what was happening in this next decade which we were moving into. Uh, E-scooters, e-bikes, speed limiters uh, coming in from 2022. What are all the things which were creating a new uh, uh, environment for us in, uh, in transport and urban mobility? And then in February, we have the Stockholm Declaration, 130 nations where the ministers were uh, resolving to set 30 kilometers per hour speed limits uh, or 20 mile an hour limits as a default where people uh, uh, who are cycling and walking mixed with motor vehicles. And then, of course, we had the COVID-19, we had the lockdown. We actually had the NHS doctors calling for a default 20 mile an hour. Uh, speed limit to protect the NHS by reducing the load on the uh, NHS. And then, of course, as we're easing lockdown, we're seeing far more cars back onto the uh, uh, roads. We're seeing people getting a little bit shy of uh, uh, public transport. And 20 mile an hour limits are seen as a key component in making our environment better for both walking and cycling. So this is really an excellent opportunity to, to get some input from people who have been involved with uh, studying 20 mile an hour limits, campaigning for them, enforcing them, et cetera. Uh, and that's what we have in, in this uh, uh, webinar. I'm pleased that we've got Adrian Davis, uh, uh, who I first met in, in, in Bristol. He's involved both uh, in, in Bristol and all, uh, also uh, uh, Edinburgh, uh, Cardiff, bringing on a, a Welsh perspective from uh, the uh, a public health uh, view. Uh, Dr. Ian Walker uh, from Bath, uh, the place where I uh, uh, grew up. Um, and I remember his early uh, work on uh, driver behavior around cyclists, uh, particularly dependent upon what sort of hairstyle or, or hat they were wearing. Uh, and uh, then uh, we've got Amanda M Russell, who is someone from the community, giving that community perspective, a campaigner for five years uh, in Faversham in Kent. Uh, and she'll be talking about that particular uh, road of progress uh, and campaigning there. And finally, Jeff Collins uh, from uh, Genoptic, the managing director there, also the enforcement expert uh, for intelligent transport systems. And he'll be giving us a view from, from that side of uh, enforcement. So. Without really uh, any more ado, I'll hand over to the uh, uh, first presenter, uh, which is Adrian Davis, and uh, then we can uh, get through each of the presentations and at the end, hopefully, have plenty of time for uh, questions and uh, answers. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, I'm just going to whiz through. I think I understand why I'm going first because I really want to touch on some of the basic aspects around uh, danger reduction in 20 miles an hour, which are, uh, have a very strong uh, symbiotic relationship. So if we can go to the first slide, please. Um, so just for those of you who want to touch base with the literature, um, a quick way to do that, I would suggest if you're not up to speed with it to avoid the pun there um there's a literature review which i did for the welsh government uh, published in uh, august 2018 um i'm not going to say too much about wales because sarah jones will probably say a lot more about uh, wales uh, later on um but uh, as part of reviewing where wales uh, was with 20 miles an hour speed limits they wanted a literature review so i carried that out for them then and i refer back to that um, as I move through. Um, 
Then at the end of 2018, there was the long-awaited Atkins study uh, for the Department of Transport. Um, and I'm really not going to say too much about that, other than it's important because it's commissioned by the Department of Transport, came to a certain opinion based on the case studies that were selected for it. And then I want to mention something that then came after those um, two uh, reports and those are two studies by uh, led by Anna Bollioni uh, and colleagues at the University of the West of England which I think are really important I will show you a slide relating, relating to the second uh, study so there's where the literature is and if we move on to the next slide thank you um, before I go any further, and it frustrates me no end, that I had to write a definition of road safety back in 1992, and I suspect some people listening may have uh, yet to be born. That's technically possible. Um, and um, what I came to the view was that the road safety has this been defined and continues to be defined by a measurement of road injuries is totally crass. Uh, it fails to really grasp the nettle and it leaves us with people who choose or want to choose to travel uh, by modes which are inherently safe but yet at risk from people driving motorised transport um, uh, from having to withdraw or perhaps withdrawing their children from the risk. So 20 miles now plays into that very much because it starts to deal with something which is at the heart of uh, liberal societies and we can go back uh, and I'm not going to do this, but we could go back to the Enlightenment, uh, we could go back to Kant, Edmund Burke, and uh, after Burke, J.S. Mill, who talked about freedom from and freedom to, in the sense that you have a freedom to do things so long as you don't impede on the freedom of others to do uh, which, what they wish to do, uh, as long as it's it legal. So clearly with the rise of uh, mass motorisation, the freedom or, or people to choose to travel actively has been massively reduced by um, the uptake of uh, private uh, car use and really the failure to um, to control it and to police it properly. Um, so what we need is a definition of road safety which is, includes freedom from as much as freedom to. So as uh, Barrel and Silcock and G said in 1992, uh, road safety usually means the unsafety of the road transport system. So we really have to move to, therefore, to road danger reduction, to tackling road danger at source. 20 miles an hour is one of, but not the only mechanism. It's an important mechanism, but not the only mechanism for achieving um, greater freedom for um, people outside of vehicles. Uh, to a large extent. So if we can have the next slide, please. So this, I'm just going to quickly refer to it. The important, one of the important points about it generally for you to read it at your leisure is that it's open access. That's a little uh, padlock in the title, which is open. Um, and as you can see in the high, we hopefully you can see in the highlighted text that the study from Bristol, which I was associated very closely with being the designer of the 20 mile an hour program in Bristol uh, uh, back from 2009-10 and doing the pilots, when the program finally finished, an independent study, which I was not part of, uh, concluded that uh, 20 mile an hour speed limit intervention was associated with a city level reduction of fatality, uh, fatal injuries of around 63 uh, percent with a 95 percent confidence in interval uh, and you can read the rest so that was a really strong paper in terms of showing about a city-wide intervention and I will come back to the idea of city and town-wide interventions in a couple of minutes as I uh, finish so Borleone's paper which is the second one of um, was really important adding to the sum of the literature on when you do do effective 20 mile an hour speed limit interventions and that does include doing some social marketing which uh, many towns have not really and towns and cities have not really done uh, next slide please but if we just go through briefly the evidence here in the next uh, text yeah and the next one um, so we have evidence on active travel so we we do know that there is some evidence that if you have 21 hour speed limits there's some evidence for increases in the use of active travel modes um, there's not much direct evidence on this, so I'd say, uh, unfortunately, because the research lens has not been there, um, the, actually the research uh, evidence is weak in this area. We move to the next point. The next point is casualty reduction, and we're very clear about casualty reduction. Don't let anyone try to 
persuade you that we don't have good evidence for the casualty reduction effects with 20 mile an hour speed limits because we, we do, it's in those previous studies I've referred to, the Borleone et al. paper is obviously one amongst many more that have shown that in the UK and, and elsewhere. Uh, next, please. Uh, then we move to air quality. I think the most we can say about air quality, and these things do get debated and we do get fake news and all the rest of it, is that really the evidence seems to be that um, the impacts are negligible, but if there's any measurement at all, it's going slightly in the right direction of, it, of improvement. And that is about the strongest we can yet say about it, again, through the lack of enough to focus on it. Next. Uh, text please and then the last one which is a fascinating area i think uh, which is about social cohesion which i best sum that up is that if you have 20 mile an hour streets and you maybe start to get more people to choose to walk and cycle down that street you may be getting more people to actually say hello to neighbors they didn't really know before because they got in their car outside the front of the house drove off and didn't connect with anyone the important point from a public health point of view at least is that we know that the more friends and acquaintances you've got, the greater protection you have against what we call all-cause mortality, which has been making the news uh, since COVID-19 is a phrase. It means death from all causes. So there's a great deal of protection to be had by having more friends and acquaintances. So if so we build social capital, have greater social cohesion in our communities, 20 miles an hour can help us to achieve that. We just don't have much evidence on it because it takes quite a lot of time i think at least five years probably five to ten years to be able to show that in a study next slide please and so um, my last slide is just saying well i've said before that 20 miles an hour is part of the mix of the interventions we need to try to have a healthier transport environment where people can choose to travel the way they wish to uh, including by on foot and by uh, bicycle etc the um the study on the right, the active travel and physical activity, was a review I was involved in for all people, all, all organisations for England who wanted to know how we could, what were the most effective interventions to increase active travel. And what we concluded out of six typologies was the most effective intervention was town and city wide interventions, which I referred to a few minutes ago. Can I just have the next point some text that appears, please? Yeah. So overall, when looking at the left uh, report, left hand side report, this was by Transport Research Laboratory um, uh, 2016, and it looked five years post um, intervention at the sustainable travel towns, which are funded by the Department of Transport some years ago. And there were some really impressive findings for the relatively small amount of money there. And it was one of the examples we had that 20 miles an hour, along with walking and cycling infrastructure, segregation, better protection of pedestrians, more crossings, a whole load of things that you'd obviously think of, all these things together seem to have a synergetic property. And so the argument probably is strongest that 20 miles an hour should be part of a town citywide or settlements uh, program uh, amongst many other interventions and then they all add to um, to build on each other and you get a stronger effect so I think that's me and that's the running through of a quick uh, bit of an introduction to 20 miles an hour thank you uh. okay Okay, thank you, uh, Adrian. Uh, and uh, uh, just to remind you, by the way, please uh, make sure you put in your questions into us. You enter the questions, uh, I think, through the application, and then we'll we'll go through those and we'll, we'll try and get as many answered as, as possible. Uh, so next up, uh, yes, uh, Sarah Jones. Uh, over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Hello there. Hi all, thanks for that. Uh, thanks for the invite to speak. Um, uh, sorry, Adrian, I'm probably not going to touch on the, the Welsh context in quite the way that uh, Adrian alluded to. Um, I would, I've been asked really to, to come and talk about what the value to the NHS is of um, a reduction in the speed limit, particularly in the, in the context that we find ourselves in, um, which is around um, the emergence of COVID-19. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so where we are from a public health perspective, as you all know uh, very well, 
Uh, we're in a situation where, particularly earlier on in this year, uh, we were talking an awful lot about the need for the NHS to um, prepare for um, the pandemic that, that, that was emerging in China. So the, the public health at that time was doing an awful lot to support the NHS in, in preparing and, and providing the right sort of service for people who found that they were um, uh, they contracted coronavirus. We also then talked a lot about the population side of it, the social distancing that we're all still practicing to one degree or another. Things still remain slightly different here in Wales to over the border in England. Um, and those were the, the two main uh, approaches that were being taken to address the, um, the, the, the COVID problem earlier on this year. And as time went on from an NHS side, a group of um, physicians in England put together an, uh, uh, a complementary approach that they labelled lowering the baseline. And that's uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, so the idea of lowering the baseline was that not only did we need to prepare the NHS to receive people with COVID-19 and to prepare the public to, um, to combat COVID-19 by uh, maintaining their distance, what we also uh, needed to do, it was being argued, was to reduce the demand on the NHS of any conditions that could possibly be avoided, any non-COVID-19 related health problems. The idea being that this would free up capacity to respond to COVID-19, but also avoid any additional spread of any unnecessary spread of COVID-19 by, for example, taking people um, into an NHS setting that they just could have avoided being in. Um, initially, um, things that were being talked about were things like promoting smoking cessation services, promoting alcohol misuse services, um, and also reducing speed limits because um, by reducing speed limits, then you reduce the risk of crashing and reduce the severity of crashes that, that do occur. And this would not only um, support um, a reduction both in the immediate burden on the NHS, but also as we move through lockdown, as we start to progress out of lockdown, allows the NHS to start to recover. The NHS can't, even if we ended lockdown right now, the NHS is still, if there was not another case of COVID-19 right now, the NHS is still going to need a lot of time to both recover as a system and for the people who work within the NHS to be able to recover and return to some sort of sense of normality. Um, next slide, please. Um, and the reason for this is that, um, as Adrian has already alluded to, as we change the um, speed at which uh, a car is involved in a crash, I, I shouldn't just say a car, I should in, implicate the driver in this. If we reduce the speed at which a driver crashes a vehicle, we massively reduce the risk both of the crash occurring in, it, in itself and also the risk of severe injury between 20 and 30 miles an hour. Um, which on this chart is between um, 30 and 50 kilometres per hour, we see a massive change in the likelihood of death, but also of serious injury. Basically, the, the, a massive change in the risk that people are going to be need to be admitted to hospital or need to go to a hospital in the first place. And right now, that's a massive concern for all of us. Next slide, please. Um, we find ourselves in this lockdown period in a situation whereby traffic has been reduced substantially. We've, we've all seen it. Plenty more of us are able to get out and about um, and walk and cycle around our neighbourhoods. However, this has also brought with it um, huge numbers of reports of vehicles travelling at excess speeds. Um, and I think I think this is is twofold uh, in the way it's in which it's been occurring. It's not just reports of more vehicles traveling at excess speeds because more of us are out and about we're on the pavement we're on our bikes we are more aware of the, the speeds that vehicles are traveling at and actually i think more of us are aware that that 30 mile an hour speed limit which as we know many drivers see um, as a target not a maximum is actually unacceptable where people are walking and cycling um, we also are aware that 
in order to maintain social distancing, in order to reduce the spread of COVID-19, we actually need to social distance. And this may mean stepping into the road. It's blindingly obvious at the moment that our pavements are absolutely completely inadequate for any number of pedestrians to be out and about. If you're um, with a small child who may be on a scooter or a bike, if you're passing somebody with uh, a, a pram or a wheelchair, the only way to deal with them is by, by stepping into the road. And it's become more and more apparent, therefore, that not only do we need more people, uh, more space for pedestrians and cyclists, but we need drivers to be more aware of their speed and to cut their speed if we are to reduce the risk of crashing. People step into the road at points that prior to the lockdown, people weren't stepping into the road and doing it in a way that the drivers would never expect. Next slide, please. So what can this do for um for for hospital attendances well this is the welsh context so you know if we if we pose the question would it make that much difference well the answer is actually yes um in reality right now keeping anyone away from a hospital is critical both to maintaining the covid19 response but also reducing the spread of infection if we look at the situation here in wales uh, we can see that um every week in Wales, in the years 2017-18, uh, there, there were around 80 crashes per week, resulting in over 110 casualties. Um, if we if we sort of equate that to the hospital side of things, that that's around 120 people um, each week going to an emergency department, which has as we all know right now, it, it's completely unnecessary at any time. It's even more unnecessary right now. Um, of those 120, around 30 needed hospital admission, admission and around two of those were needing admission to critical care. At the very outset of the, the coronavirus outbreak, we were, told, we were being told, and, and it is still very much the case, um, at rapid access of people with coronavirus to a critical care bed was absolutely essential to ongoing um, successful outcome. If we've got 7% of um, RT uh, road traffic crash victims needing critical care, that's potentially getting in the way of somebody with coronavirus actually accessing that bed. And, um, you know, it's in, it, while we don't want to be debating the ethics of who is more deserving, actually, we can say that the road traffic crash occurring at a speed that is unacceptable is, is completely avoidable. Um, so, so that's sort of, that's, that's the critical care side of things. Um, and it's, is, um, I think by um, all of our um, judgments, absolutely avoidable and completely um, necessary. If we if we look at what um, has happened in the Isle of Man, they've only got um, six intensive care beds. And at the beginning of the um, the outbreak of COVID-19, it was actually decided for the first time in the history of the Isle of Man that they would introduce a speed limit on the island because the um, intensive care consultant there made the point that they couldn't afford for one of their intensive care beds to be taken up by something that was entirely avoidable. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, if you're not convinced by me, be convinced by somebody far more eminent than me. Uh, Danny Dawling uh, is a bit of a legend in public health services circles. He's, um, he's a geographer and he was asked um, if he could do just one thing to reduce health related inequalities, what would that be? Um, and uh, I think it was a bit, of, a bit of a surprise to those who were organising or asking him the question. Um, he uh, argued that um, the introduction of 20 mile an hour speed limits was one of the most, one of the cheapest and most effective methods for improving public health today. Uh, you've got more of the detail of, of what he said there, but I think critical to that right now is that uh, COVID-19 has undoubtedly uh, increased inequalities in our society. Uh, finding ways in which we can reduce those inequalities will be far more pressing than they ever have been. Uh, and if 20 miles an hour is one of the, the um, steps that we can take to narrow those inequalities, then I believe it's something that we need to do as a matter of urgency. Thanks all for your time. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, that was uh, excellent uh, uh, for that um, uh, public health perspective uh, uh, from Wales.
Uh, now, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ian Walker, uh, and um, I'm interested to hear his presentation, or I have, must admit I have uh, seen him present that before. So, uh, yes, over uh, to Ian. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, and thanks for inviting me, and thank you to, the, to uh, Adrian and Sarah for uh, such interesting presentations. And I'm, I'm going to kind of touch on a couple of things that they've raised. I think I really, really liked Adrian's contextualising all of this issue in the context of freedom and this question of whether one person's freedom to drive should trump another person's freedom to be safe in the streets. And I think that's a really, really helpful way to, to frame this issue. And I'm also going to pick up on some of these issues that uh, Sarah alluded to about inequality, because I think fundamentally uh, the way we're using our streets is a matter of equality and inequality. And what I'm going to suggest today is that we're making mistakes in the way that we run our streets that we're starting to fix elsewhere in society, but we're still making those same mistakes when it comes to traffic. And 20 mile an hour is a really great place to see that phenomenon at large. So what I want to do today is just spend five minutes just so it's taking a little bit of a step back and just looking at the wider context. Um, and in particular, trying to just use 20 mile an hour suggestions and using you know, the, the fantastic ideas that are being floated around 20 mile an hour as a way of exploring the challenges we have with road safety in general. And so the way I've come at this is to say, well, why wouldn't you go to 20 mile an hour in built up areas? Why haven't we gone to 20 mile an hour as the default? What are the barriers? And I think a lot of the people here today will recognize some of these things I flagged up here. And I've done this in a kind of deliberately jokey way, but it's fascinating when you float the idea of turning uh, a residential street into a 20 mile an hour zone, um, suddenly all these experts appear out of the woodwork. All the, all the environmentalists suddenly appear and start talking about how it'll cause more pollution. And all the, uh, the philanthropists who you know, have been quiet so far uh, and you know, who've maybe never drawn attention to themselves in the past by being concerned about older people or people with disabilities, suddenly become very concerned about people with disabilities the moment speed limits are mentioned. Uh, you get the, the expert economists coming out of the pub and pointing out how much it will harm local businesses if we drove at 20 miles an hour. And you get, 20 mile, uh, you get the, the engineers. And, and actually, interestingly, that final quote is literally a quote from somebody who came up to me in the street after I had a meeting with Adrian Davis once years ago. Uh, I was stood in the car park outside the back of Bristol City Council about to get on a motorbike and somebody's walked up and said that to me. Well, of course, it's, you know, they're looking at 20 mile an hour zones, but it's well known that engine management systems are designed for 30 and can't handle 20. Um, so we hear so many blithe, often repeated reasons not to do it. And I, I'm sure you know, a lot of you in the same boat, we've all heard these same excuses many, many times. Uh, next slide, please. Critically, these reasons are wrong. Adrian's already shown us why some of them are wrong, and the rest are wrong as well. Um, the people who are saying these things, when somebody says, I oppose 20 mile an hour because it will harm local business, or what about the disabled? Um, they do not know these things to be true. They absolutely are not saying these things from a point of knowledge or expertise. They are saying them in a different way. And so the question I want to ask people to think about and maybe dwell upon a bit after today is what are people really trying to communicate when they say things like, well, of course, you know, it's well known it'll create more pollution if you slow cars down. And, you know, I, when I was writing these slides, I had various uh, slightly uncharitable interpretations. So I thought about saying, you know, maybe what people are saying is, please stop asking me to think. Uh, but I, I decided to take that out. Um, but the, the version I, I quite, I, I sort of came around to was maybe what people are really saying when they trot out 
these received wisdom excuses for not changing to a 20 mile an hour system is please stop challenging a worldview that I absorbed without question, especially when it gives me an advantage over other people. And I think there's quite a few elements of that that are potentially quite important here. Um, everybody who's in our streets today has only ever known a world where cars come first. And so if you're a, a regular driver, if you're someone who drives through a town or a village regularly, you're used to having the street designed and engineered and policed and operated and funded largely for your benefit. In other words, the world has pretty much been arranged for your convenience if you habitually get around town with a car. Next slide, please. What this got me thinking about was this very, very interesting idea that people have floated in other contexts. So typically this idea has been discussed in the context of say gender or race or things like this. But I think it's really interesting to think about it in this context. If all you've known is privilege, equality feels like oppression. And I think it's a very powerful idea in a lot of the different contexts. And I think it's relevant here. I, my contention or the suggestion I'm going to make today is one of the chief reasons that we see resistance to 20 is because the people who are offering resistance and in many cases trotting out these excuses that they've heard from other people just instinctively feel threatened by any change to our transport street system. Uh, they have benefited from a system that prioritizes them over other people. And, you know, in a sense, understandably, anyone who uh, feels threatened will lash out and seek to make that threat go away. And so I'm going to suggest that a big part of this is what is happening here. People have had the street arranged for their convenience and any hint that streets should be policed or operated differently feels like their freedom is being taken away and people are blind to the fact that this is necessary in order for other people to have their freedom to use the streets safely. So next slide please. Uh, so very briefly, should we be treating driving like other forms of social privilege? Uh, and there's been some very interesting recent examples of this. Um, you know, we've just in the last couple of days, uh, Trafford Council in Manchester uh, put up temporary pop-up cycle infrastructure. And within two days, they ripped it out again because a handful of drivers complained it was in their way. And as somebody said, you know, it's only made a wonderful comment about the power dynamic here. They said, it's like taking away a zebra proof fence because the lions have complained that it's got in their way, uh, which I thought was a very nice way of putting it. Uh, next slide, please. So what I want to suggest uh, as kind of the take home message is that why is this happening? How is this happening? How do people not notice that they they are demanding freedom to drive in a way that is um, impairing other people's freedom to use the streets? How do people not aware of this? And I think the bigger, the big picture that surrounds all of this is that fundamentally, our culture has a blind spot when it comes to motoring. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of evidence. So if you can just go to the next slide, uh, this is just one little bit of data. This is from a study that Adrian and I worked on together a couple of years ago. And we found that if you poll the people of Britain, uh, you get completely different answers to the same question, depending whether you mention cars or not. So as you can see, the people of Britain are pretty much agreed that you shouldn't blow smoke in people's faces unless the smoke happens to come out of a car, in which case it's magically fine. And this was our, our way of trying to quantify and demonstrate this blind spot that we have when it comes to the issue of cars. We suspend our usual morals and our usual values when it comes to this one particular thing. And so people who otherwise would almost certainly um, uh, you know, understand fairness and equality, don't see it the moment motoring is, in, is mentioned. Uh, if we just skip on uh, two slides, just really quickly. And uh, if we just go, yeah, there we go. Um, so, you know, the other big aspect of this is that we treat 
uh, motor danger fundamentally different to other dangers. We treat it, you know, that cultural blind spot that I just talked about is evident everywhere when we look at uh, the danger from motoring. Now, the proper way to address a hazard is to remove the hazard. Um, and the one place we don't do that is in the motoring context. And, you know, I, I want to suggest that in large part, this is because of that cultural blind spot. And what I'm going to say is that an almost a final point is, I think that cultural blind spot is so endemic that we need to look at ourselves really carefully as well. So something I've heard quite often, including recently from someone in the police, is, well, if we set 20 mile an hour limits, people will drive at 30 and that's okay because that's what we kind of wanted in the first place. And I was quite shocked to hear that being said. And I've heard that from various people of, you know, well, they don't actually drive at 20, but it does make them slow down a little bit. And that lack of ambition really worries me a bit. You know, is the, the cultural blind spot so big that even we who want to campaign for safer streets are happy with law breaking because it's just not as bad as the law breaking that went before? And so we, maybe we need to take a look at ourselves and, and ask whether we're being affected by these blind spots. If a law is there, a law should be followed. If the law is wrong, the law can be changed, but we shouldn't uh, lower our standards of legal adherence just because it's about cars. And so on to the final slide, what I want to suggest is that this needs systemic institutional change. What we have, I'm going to suggest, is we have an unconscious bias arising from our culture. We have similar biases about other things, and I've mentioned gender and race and uh, income. We have similar biases about other things. And I want to suggest that a bias of this sort is also at, at work when it comes to transport issues. So how do we solve that? Well, the first step is for decision makers to understand that they have systemic unconscious biases in their decision processes and that they are making decisions from a position of privilege that affect other people and that they may be unable to see the needs and experiences of other people in society and then once decision makers have acknowledged that they maybe have blind spots that they cannot fix we have to put in place systems uh, that allow those decisions to become fairer and to take into account the needs of more marginalised people. In this case, the non-motorised users of streets. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. That, that was really, uh, really fascinating. I, I, and I hadn't seen that slide, be, uh, that set of slides before. Uh, so it really was some, uh, uh, some new thoughts for me. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, moving on uh, um, to uh, Amanda. Amanda Russell has been working in Faversham for uh, uh, five years uh, campaigning for 20 mile an hour. And like other campaigners, she'll know all the arguments against 20 mile an hour. And we know all the arguments to overcome those arguments as well. So I'll hand over to uh, Amanda, who's going to tell me, uh, tell us uh, about the road she's travelled uh, for those those past five years. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Rod. Um, hello, I'm Amanda, and I live in Faversham in Kent, as you heard, and I'm a 20s Betty campaigner. Um, and next slide, please. The Faversham campaign began in 2015 after two fatal accidents on crossings and a hit and run involving a school child. It felt as though traffic was dominating people's lives in many unhealthy ways and that we needed to find a better balance. A group of residents supported by our local Green Party launched a 20s Penty campaign and petition and we gained the support of our town council and they advised us to approach Kent County Council. But KCC's cabinet member for transport said they would not lead or fund a 20 mile an hour scheme here on the grounds that it was too expensive, our residents are too fit and well, and there had not been enough casualties. So we looked at those statistics in more detail. Next slide, please. According to Crash Map, there had been 140 incidents in five years, and we discovered that the two fatalities I mentioned earlier hadn't been included in those figures because they'd occurred later in hospital and not at the roadside. We could see that the public health indicators were actually very high, with four wards across Faversham 
achieving an average score of 108, placing us in the worst or top third worst of Kent's rankings. Next slide, please. Here you can see the obesity, obesity levels for year six children in Swale. In one Faversham ward, St Anne's, they are amongst the highest in the country, with an adjacent priory ward scoring just below that. Um, Kent's own joint health and wellbeing strategy told us that Kent is performing worse than the national average in obesity in adults, and the Swale District Health Profile showed us the same. Next slide, please. This is a pedestrian crossing on the A2, also known as Ospring Street or Watling Road. Children from the local primary and secondary schools cross here every day, twice a day, with lorries passing really close by, often mounting pavements. And it's right in the middle of an air quality monitoring area where many residents also live. All are being exposed to levels of pollution that represent a significant health hazard. So we decided to present this evidence to Swales Joint Transportation Board and demonstrate how a 20 mile per hour limit could address these safety and health concerns. And to our relief, they tasked us with setting up a working group to examine how best to implement a 20 mile per hour speed limit in Faversham. And this working group was unique because it was comprised of elected councillors and community campaigners who would go on to work together for the next four years. Next slide, please. We next engaged more residents in more depth and on a stall in our market square we invited people to place red dots on the town map to indicate places where traffic made them feel unsafe to walk or cycle. The map was also posted on our official Facebook page where many more residents continue to comment. This provided us with valuable social engagement. We found that residents were keen to talk about their experiences as well as learn about the benefits of 20 miles per hour on their streets and it opened up a two-way flow of communication. Next slide, please. When we compared the protest map with crash map, we could also see that accidents were occurring in the places where residents were most fearful. So our perception of danger on our streets is accurate. Um, we're very fortunate to have the expert presence of Tim Stoner of Space Syntax as both a campaigner and local resident. And he recommended the work of independent transport advisor, Phil Jones of Phil Jones Associates. We persuaded the Town Council to fund PJA to undertake a feasibility study for a 20 mile per hour zone on all residential streets in Faversham. And this appraisal gave principles and recommendations which we then put to Swales Joint Transportation Board later that year. And they voted unanimously to accept all of them. And the key recommendation was for the limit to be town wide. And at that meeting, the board also proposed an amendment for a borough wide limit across, Sway, uh, across Swale. Next slide, please. Um, since then, we've carried out various types of community engagement. Some of it has been to raise awareness and encourage compliance and long-term behaviour change. Next slide, please. And some of it has been to gather residents' feedback to inform the scheme's design. And at Faversham's annual transport weekend event, um, Phil Jones gave a series of presentations to residents with images demonstrating the innovative calming measures proposed, many of which residents would not have seen before. We also displayed a large map showing those interventions and we gathered resident feedback, which Phil Jones then incorporated into the next phase of design. Next slide, please. So this is the map which we showcased to residents with the technical interventions to support the 20 mile per hour townwide zone clearly marked. It was also featured in local press stories and on our Facebook page and the Town Council's website. Um, and our hope was that this town-wide 20 mile per hour zone would deliver on the three key objectives of our scheme, casualty reduction, improved air quality and reduced health, on, in, health inequalities, including adult child obesity. Next slide, please. On May 10th, 2019, KCC approved all of the technical rec recommendations put forward by Phil Jones Associates. And later that month, KCC published their revised 20 mile per hour policy, which directly recognized two key elements of Faversham's scheme. The use of more innovative and less intrusive traffic calming measures on higher speed streets, and the importance of community demand over casualty rates and deprivation statistics. Although we know more needs to be done, we hope these changes will make wide area 20 mile per hour limits where people live more achievable and affordable. And the pressure is very much on. 
Next slide, please. In 2019, the Faversham Society and the University of Kent embarked on a traffic pollution survey to more accurately measure pollution levels on the A2 in several additional locations. Led by Professor Chris Wright, also a Faversham resident, the study measured PM2.5 and PM10 particles, as well as nitrogen dioxide. And significantly, it also measured both at child height. Next slide, please. The findings of that study have culminated in the Mid-Kent Environmental Health Group extending their traffic pollution monitoring to four more sites in Faversham. And you can read more about that study on the Faversham Society website at favershamsociety.org forward slash traffic air quality. In the wider context, housing development on three sides of the town is significantly increasing Faversham's population. And with both that, that there is an urgent need for interconnectivity and travel that is not dominated by car use. Um, the KCC policy changes have made our scheme eligible for LCP funding, um, and we are currently waiting to hear if we have qualified for DFT funding to reorganise our streets in response to COVID-19. KCC now very much want to fund and lead this scheme, and it's possible that because of the COVID pandemic, we could see the first phase of implementation begin in September, our hope is that KCC will ensure they engage fully with the community throughout the implementation process and afterwards, so that this scheme really does achieve its goal of safer, cleaner, healthier streets for its residents. Um, and that's all from me, and I'll just leave you with a few slides with messages from some of our younger supporters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Amanda. Uh, now I'd like to hand over to uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Just having a little control trouble here. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am the, the final presentation before we go into the, the interactive discussion session. So please remember to send any messages you have um, through, the, through the portal. I am going to give you a little bit of a background to one approach for the, the technical management of road safety, looking at 20 mile an hour zones. Um, I give that advice based on my 16 years experience as a director for Unoptic. I'm also um, the chairman of the ITS UK Enforcement Interest Group. So I have a particular interest, knowledge and enthusiasm for some of the technologies I'm going to talk about. The, the graphic here shows you the increase in the number of average speed camera sites which are being used around the UK. I don't need to go into it in detail, but what you'll notice is that there appear to be three distinct phases of, of growth in the, in the use of the technology. And it's largely as a result of improvements in what technology can do and a reduction in the overall cost of how the, the technology can be applied because it's the nature of enforcement solutions, which are their purpose is to replace a policeman at the side of the road. They are not particularly cheap elements due to all of the approvals that, uh, that they had to go through, but I can tell you a little bit more about that. One of the reasons there's been the significant growth in the use of technologies of this type is because they have been delivering benefits very much of the type that we have been looking for and we've talked about in the previous presentations. And I describe it as a virtuous circle because there is a relationship between traffic flow and congestion and then the associated casualties and collisions, and then the rate or the speed at which vehicles go through and the environmental conditions that that imposes. So going into a little bit more detail, the reason this technology is used and it works is because it makes traffic flow better. And I'm sure you, you may have driven through an average speed control zone yourself, and you'll notice that you're not overtaken by much quicker vehicles. You have everything tra traveling at a steady and uniform rate. And what does that lead to? That means that you have fewer incidences where vehicles actually come together and have a collision, which is the primary cause of a casualty. So things are flowing better and there are fewer collisions. There's a tertiary benefit, but it is actually, it's all a circle, that if, if speeds are uniform and harmonized, you're burning less fuel, you're putting fewer 
emissions and particulates out there's less vibration there's less noise as well so for example in a, in a village environment if traffic is traveling through steadily there are a number of benefits to the the residents in the area and these benefits are all being understood much better now which is one reason why there's been an increase in the type of technology used so just quickly to show you where around the UK this technology is used you probably have come across it when you've driven through major road work but what you maybe don't realize is that there are hundreds and hundreds of these permanent installations in towns, villages, interurban, major carriageways. But the majority of them actually are on lower speed limit roads, with 30 mile an hour limits being the most frequently seen enforced speed limit. And I'll come, come back to that in a moment. But you, you'll notice some of the early adopters, such as Nottingham and Nottinghamshire, they have 28 routes currently which are using average speed cameras because they have seen the benefit. So where is the greatest growth now? The, the, the photo here, you, you can clearly see a camera which is on a street lighting column. And that is a far more cost-effective way of delivering this type of solution than having to trench cabling, put in a new column, put a cabinet there as well. It was very much one of the limiting factors historically was the, the actual cost to install equipment of this type. And so more and more people are now looking at groups or batches of villages or areas which are covered by this type of thing. And it seems to be that the number seven is the most common. I have no idea why, but we have batches of um, villages in Bedford, Leicester, Birmingham, Cornwall, and a number of other locations which have recently put in rather than one route, but putting several in at the same time. And it's it's important to point out that the majority of these are 30 mile an hour. There's no reason it couldn't be 20 mile an hour. There are 20 mile an hour routes which we have operational, but they haven't been embraced in the same way that 30s are. But that's arguably because there are more 30 mile an hour limits at the moment, which fulfill the criteria to put some of the equipment in. But I've mentioned here as well, it's the cost effectiveness, which is the most important thing, because they are never going to be cheap. But there are two elements. There's the initial cost to put the equipment in the ground, but then there's the ongoing operation. And that is one of the thorny issues that we may talk about later. We touched on driver uh, behavior, driver behavior, trying to change the way people do things. And these charts here show the speed distribution in a 20, a 30, a 40, and a 50 mile an hour limit where average speed cameras are. And if you look at that distribution. You'll see it's a normal distribution curve with very, very little deviation. Um, and it is the same in 20 as 30 as 40 and 50. And I, I suggest that that is because you are changing driver behavior very effectively, very quickly, and the driver is taking full responsibility for their action. It's not the car, it is not the environment which is controlling the speed. That is the driver making a conscious decision to abide with the 20 mile an hour limit. And touching on a comment that Ian made earlier, one issue about enforcement of 20 mile an hour limits is, do you actually want vehicles driving at 19 miles an hour or do you want them driving at just under 30? Because the data shows if you enforce 20, 20 is what you get. And in many cases, that's not actually what people are looking for. So current best practice, here's a couple of examples of routes which have been installed in the last few months. And the one on the right actually went in during lockdown. So it was, a, it was an interesting challenge. And it's the equipment being mounted on a street lighting column, which makes it much easier, quicker, simpler to do. And you'll notice we've put a highly visible retro reflective panel, one and a half meter panel on the lighting column to draw to the attention of drivers what is going on because the very best way of getting compliance is for people to know and to understand what is going on it's absolutely one of the key features in getting or earning compliance is for people to know what is happening and why um, but that is just one flavor one way of doing it the an effective scheme should always be designed around the environment and what you're trying to achieve so the the image on the left is a passively safe column in a village where there is no street lighting. So that column could be hit by a vehicle and the vehicle won't be pretty afterwards, but the column will actually break, um, thus, making it, thus making it safer. And my final uh, point to bring everything together 
is just to, to reiterate, 20 mile an hour limits rather than 20 mile, 20 mile an hour zones can be enforced, and they are. It is done in a number of locations around the UK, and I know for I, I definitely know that it will work and it will earn the compliance that you want and the driver behavior will change but you need to be clear if that is actually what you're trying to achieve with this but there are some notes of caution and it might be that these come up in the subsequent discussion you have to be clear on what you're trying to do um, and who is going to enforce it because a lot of people assume you put the equipment in and magically the police will do everything that you want but increasingly the police have a finite resource, a finite amount of time and a finite amount of money to spend on this. And it's not the fabled money tree that will provide money for the local authority or for the police either. Um, and never forget that home office type approval is a real, real challenge and it's not going to change anytime soon. So the hope that there will be lots of freely available low cost cameras that will allow you to carry out criminal enforcement I think we're quite a long way from that, but we've made, made great strides. But I'd just like to say as well that cameras are a part of an answer. They are not the entire answer and they should very much form um, a wider consideration. And that was my, my quick whiz through. And um, I now like to head, um, hand back over to Rod, who I think is gonna to pull together the interactive session. Thank you. Right. Uh... Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, now for me is a big challenge because this is the bit which uh, I thought would be really difficult uh, uh, because we've got a lot of questions. And I'm gonna try and field the questions, uh, maybe answer some of them uh, 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 myself, but hopefully uh, th that everyone can get the understanding at the end of it, which they're, they're looking for. So I'm gonna try and bring all our, uh, panelists back in now so if the, the panelists can uh, come back in on webcam uh, I think there's um, Adrian that's it we're all here Ian is on phone only so we we will be able to hear him uh, but not uh, see him um, right uh, a number of uh, questions um, first one was from Kenneth Gledhill was asking how can more convincing and demonstrable evidence of the impact of introducing speed reduction uh, initiatives best be obtained? Now you've given us some of that, uh, uh, Adrian, uh, a pointer on that. I know we've got some on our website which people can, can, can look at, but you'd like to give a quick response to that? Um, yeah, I suppose, uh, Yes, obviously, Trent is plenty. Uh, WHO uh, Europe uh, uh, has got quite a lot of stuff now on 30 kph, uh, the OECD. The list is quite long. Uh, it's just it would be almost uh, put everything on 20 plenty's uh, website. Um, you've got the links to the papers that I've um, mentioned. I mean, I think if you took the literature review, by going back prior to 2018 or or early in the date that I was published, that will give you a large stock of uh, um, sources of evidence. The challenge for the public and people outside universities is the um, is the paywall. So it's getting to academic peer reviewed research. And what we need is summaries of uh, of, of, the, of the research. So the literature review is is one of those. And I would encourage people to go to Borleone et al and try and wade your way through that. It's not not too long, but a very helpful uh, study. But do look at what WHO say. Do look at what OECD say. They did a really important uh, study on speed uh, last last year. And of course, one thing which you can always do placed in that situation is ask what the evidence is that for 30 mile an hour uh, being a correct default for mm -hmm. uh, urban and village streets. The fact is there are 75,000 casualties per annum on 30 mile an hour roads. And there isn't actually a great deal of evidence which is uh, pointing out that 30 mile an hour is appropriate uh, for those uh, streets. Um, Next question, uh, and I apologize, I'm not, we're not gonna get everybody's question uh, answered, but uh, one from Jennifer Coombs is what 
support can 2020 give to the lobby the government for 20 mile an hour limits? And I, and I think probably the best uh, person to answer that is Sarah. Sarah, um, where in fact the government has in Wales uh, is uh, got a plan to implement 20 mile an hour. So maybe if Sarah can give me uh, give us uh, a, a view uh, on that, please, for Jennifer. Uh, hi, thanks, yes, Rod. Uh, yep, um, the the intention here in Wales is that 20 will become the default speed limit uh, within the next couple of years. Um, there's also the opportunity been offered by COVID-19 um, for some local authorities to bring forward their introduction of 20. Um, you know, in terms of, of how that's brought forward, um, I think you know, we've, we've got um, we've got some very, very supportive politicians here in Wales. Um, our First Minister and uh, Transport Minister and Deputy Transport Minister uh, are all keen to see the introduction of 20. Um, and I think with a lot of these things, it's, it's not necessarily that, that it's, it's as much as anything that the time comes for them. Um, and it's it's how it's convincing enough people really that and and the pressure being exerted in the right place um, with the right people who've got the the enthusiasm and the inclination to make a change um, and it's it's it, it's not an easy process. There's no there's no book that I can direct you to and I know because I've been talking about road safety issues for a long time. There's no book that I can direct you to that says. Um, here is how to get the road safety intervention that you want implemented. It'd be so much easier if there was. Um, but um, in, in my experience, it's it's building. It's about building the evidence base and making the case with the right people at the right time. As uh, being also being involved in the, the, the Welsh or lobbying for the Welsh decision, I think what impressed me most about Wales was a, a focus on the values which the, the government had, uh, values for equality, values for future generations and so on, and then putting 20 mile an hour in as an initiative which supported those values. And I think this is, touches on some of the things which Ian was talking about and also to, to, to Amanda, in that, in that what we have to do is to register those values of what, what people think is valuable, what is right for their lives, what is right for their, their, their communities, and then put a lower speed limit into the context of that. But then it becomes a solution rather than just something which some, some sector is, is, is lobbying for. Um, question here uh, for uh, Ian, and it's from Ian Thompson. It comes Back to this whole thing about public consensus as well. I saw in the newspaper this morning people ignoring advice and common sense by flocking to the beaches and ignoring social distance guidelines. I cannot understand how you expect people to drive at 20, even though it makes sense. Uh, it's, well, it, Ian does says it's not impossible, but uh, I, I think maybe Jeff can answer that, 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 that question in a, a, a moment. But Ian, this is very much about social consensus. Could you perhaps answer uh, that question for us? Well, I probably can't give you a definitive answer, but I can certainly have a go. I think that that question touches on something really, really important. And um, I think it, it, you know, I mentioned the police when I was talking earlier, and you know, there may well be some police on on the line now. Um, and I think. It's really interesting when you think about enforcement, and obviously this touches on Jeff's domain as well. When you think about enforcing a law, um, typically, and probably actually in every other case, I want to say, in every other case, um, the law prohibits something that only a minority would do. And traffic, again, I'm going to suggest because we have a weird cultural blind spot about it, traffic is the one place I can think of. Uh, where that's not true, where law law breaking is the norm, where law breaking is absolutely endemic and most people do it a lot of the time. And 
to police in a situation where most people break the law is understandably difficult from the perspective of both police and politicians. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't address it. Um, and I think there's a, there's a couple of ways forward. First is, like I said earlier, we've got to acknowledge that we are not making rational decisions in this area. Our judgments about this topic are flawed. We have to ask ourselves, would we tolerate these outcomes in any other area? Would we tolerate 1800 unnecessary deaths in any other area? Would we tolerate mass law breaking in any other area? And I think as soon as we can ask the question outside the sphere of cars, people might start to see the problem. Um, and then the other thing that gives me some hope is to say, well, there have also been other examples of mass behavior change. Um, you know, changes in, you know, there was a time not that long ago where smoking was a hugely popular activity amongst the young folk. Um, and despite the fact at some points it's something that most adults did, the government nevertheless said, this is a bad thing, we want you to stop it and we're going to take steps to start stamping this out. And so we have tackled issues like that in the past. Um, we've certainly done it in terms of equality in the past um we now you know we've, yeah in fact we have with equality we have at some points in the past told the majority of people they're wrong about various things so we need to bite you know bite the bullet seize the nettle and punch the bull or whatever it is um and start to take on this other mass situation with the same resolve that we did those Rod, you're muted. Rod, you're muted. My apologies, right? I said I was going to get some things wrong. Uh, Jeff, you'll have plenty of experience. 20 mile an hour limits, enforceable or not enforceable? Uh, absolutely, they they are enforceable. There's plenty of technology out there that will do it. I think it's more the practicalities around it, because um, people rarely have just one very short location that they uh, that they want to deal with. But yes, it um, it absolutely can be done, and it is done now. I think it's the wider considerations around it that require further thought. Okay, uh, I'm very conscious that I've got a. A big list of questions, and uh, uh, we, we've got uh, approximately uh, eight minutes left. So what I've been trying to do is just make some notes of the questions right the way through, and I, I'm going to try and make sure they all get answered by by answering summary, uh, uh, if, if 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 that's okay. Um, I think it keeps coming back to this about public consensus. This is about changing attitudes and public consensus about what we how we drive our vehicles in the presence of other people. Um, and, and let's remember that in, in successive British attitude surveys, 70% of people wanted a three mile an hour limit for residential streets and only 11% opposed it. So there's a strong foundation of public support for it. What we have to do is hook into that public support and put it into the context which allows people to uh, if you like, do the right thing, both in setting the right limits and also in, in, in observing them. When it comes to public uh, police enforcement, it's very much a binary issue. No one is ex expecting a policeman on every corner, but there's a huge difference between a, uh, a chief constable who says we're not going to enforce 20 mile limits, as they do in some parts of the country, and another police constable, uh, chief constable, who will say, we do enforce them, they're as enforceable as any uh, other, and you never know, we could actually be on that street where you're driving over a 20 mile an hour limit and we'll nab you. And actually, even in Somerset Police in 2018, issued 20, over 25,000 notices of intended prosecution on 20 mile an hour roads. So if anyone says that uh, 20 mile an hour limits are not enforceable, then send them to go and drive around Avon Som Somerset for a bit, and they'll soon find out how enforceable uh, they are. Questions about traffic regulation orders. Um, yes, one of the things that you can do is put in a, a experimental traffic regulation orders 
with much less red tape than if they're a permanent one, but those only last for 18 months. And that's similar to the ones which are done on the, the, the COVID-19, they can be done quickly. And then within that 18 months, you can look at turning those into uh, a, a permanent uh, a, a, a TROs. Uh, one of the things which, which came out from, I think, which something which Amanda showed, which was those maps of where people felt unsafe and where people actually were unsafe because there had been a casualty, was actually uh, the biggest cluster we have is the unclustered spots, right, within our, our, our road network, where we can't predict what's going to, to happen. And I think in the past, we've always treated road safety as some site-specific problem, which we have then done some site-specific engineering on. 20 mile an hour limits are about a population-wide intervention. And that's one of the things which the public health people, uh, Adrian and Sarah, will know that actually, if you made a small change to the whole population, then that can be much more effective than making a, a much larger uh, if like intervention for a, a small part of it and you know when it comes to enforcement uh or, sorry not enforcement but compliance um it was found by the uh recent report which uh, adrian uh, alluded to that actually within residential roads 74 percent of drivers right were within the police enforcement threshold of 24 miles an hour so they were 24 miles an hour or less. And within cities, they were 80% were, were, were below that. So whilst there is some compliance, non-compliance with all speed limits, there is a, 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 a good and reasonable compliance with 20 mile an hour limits. And again, in, in, in DFT analysis, it's shown that where you have free flowing 20 mile an hour and 30 mile an hour limits without any hazards, bends or anything else, then the speeds, average speeds on 20 mile an hour roads are six miles an hour less than on 30 mile an hour roads. So there's you know a, a, a lot of good evidence uh, 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 there. With regard to some of the questions which there have been about uh, uh, villages and so on, um, Yes, it's just as beneficial for villages as it is for, for city dwellers. And indeed, we have a number of county-wide campaigns where uh, the uh, campaigners are, are looking to change the policy of the county in order to get it much more in line and much more conducive to, to putting in uh, 20 mile an hour limits on an authority-wide basis, because that is the, the thing which sets that consistent speed limit based on values of people walking, cycling to school, to the shops, where they live, where they work, where they uh, uh, learn, and making all of those uh, places more pleasant places to be with a 20 mile an hour limit uh, compared to a, a, a 30 uh, mile an hour. Um, uh, see, Rod, yeah, sorry, it's still we can, we can We can run for another 10 minutes, so if you'd like to put okay. some more questions to the panel, that will be absolutely fine. I think some of the panels are eager to answer some questions. Thanks. Yes, yes. okay. Uh, let me see what we've got here. Uh, Right, one for Amanda. Um, and this is a, a, a long uh, question, right? But uh, do you, uh, Rosa, are you looking to extend the policy for Faversham to the whole of uh, uh, Kent? Uh, and it's also a, a, a question about uh, villages, uh, which are linear villages, which are with an A road through them, uh, and uh, how uh, 20 mile an hour limits will, will benefit those. So, uh, Amanda, perhaps for the question uh, of, about Kent, and uh, maybe Adrian on the the linear uh, villages, right? A uh, linear road through through villages, uh, and how 20 mile an hour will, will, will work there. So, first, Amanda. Um, 
In terms of the, the county-wide question, um, when we presented to the Swell Transportation Board, it was the councillors there who um, were already familiar with us because we'd presented it to them before, but but they thought it was, it was the councillors themselves that felt they'd had enough uh, demand from their own constituents across Swale um, to make that amendment for a borough-wide limit. Now, that's sort of been pushed into the long grass over the years, but it does, it does um, kind of um, reoccur every now and then when we make presentations, and we try and bring that into our discussions just to keep it forefront in the minds of the councillors. And we, 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 we look at it within the sort of context of, of health and well-being and affordability so that we know that it makes sense, it's more affordable, we know that we're more likely to achieve those objectives if, if you can get in a wider area limit. Um, and Adrian Berent, who is the 20th Penny for Kent campaigner, has been working on all sorts of areas of policy and, and, and at cabinet member level to try and impress um, on um, Kent County Council the benefits and value of, of putting in wider limits. And just before I hand over to Adrian Davis, I'd probably say that from my perspective, it would have to come from my fellow residents. So, so we, I get e emails from villages surrounding Faversham who see what we're doing, and I've had all four. There's been on all four sides of, of Faversham, I've had requests from villagers saying, "How can we do this on our villages, which are linear roads, A, A, A roads?" So, um, so that tells me that you know these these people. There is a demand there. So yes, I mean, and I'd like to hand over to Adrian for to hear more actually from him. Well, um, so in terms of villages and just in the context of what Wales is setting up in terms of planning for the introduction of uh, 20 miles an hour default, um, there will be a, probably a settlement study which will look at different settlement sizes from big places like Cardiff uh, down to the smallest settlements which are bisected by a main road perhaps, uh, but there'll be a settlement of maybe to 5,000 people living there. And, and the key thing we've been using with Transport for Wales, where we'll be using a very useful mapping tool that they've generated, is really about movement and place function. So where you have a lot of pedestrian activity around a school, uh, with uh, shop fronts, uh, residential fronts onto the street, then you need to think about having a 20 mile an hour speed limit there. And if you've got a national speed limit, uh, outside the village, then there's the issue of should you have a buffer zone, i.e. should you be slowing down the traffic before it actually hits the village rather than saying you're going to go from 60 to a 20, which is probably not a very sensible thing to do. So first, the first principle is about place and movement. Look at what people do in, in the village, in the settlement, small town, village, whatever, um, and then you make the judgment about this should be a 20 because it could be if there's nothing happening on the frontages on the main road going through the village, then you could have 20 just on the side roads. But it's likely that there's uh, areas of the village where there will be significant pedestrian activity. Obviously, if there is a, uh, a school, village halls, and the other things we usually find in villages. Um, so place and um, uh, movement function, buffer zones, um, and, and considering the actual nature of the area, which would include things like casualty status as well, but casualty status, as I've alluded to, uh, could be hiding the fact that people uh, restrict their own movement, they don't have casualties, so it's only one uh, of, of the tests. So you've got to be careful about these sorts of uh, uh, areas, but place and function is really uh, the critical aspect. Okay, uh, I, and I have a... Uh... Uh, a question here uh, directed to uh, uh, to Sarah. What, what was the most effective campaign tool to engage with with, with drivers? Uh, most effective campaign tool. I'm I'm not sure that I'm best placed to answer that. I, I, I'm uh, I, I'd, I'd never regard myself as a campaigner. I'm a, a public health advocate, uh, someone like Amanda or Jeff without passing the, uh, sorry, not Jeff, someone like Amanda may be a better place to answer this one. 
uh, at the risk of passing the buck, Rod. Amanda, right. What's what's the best tool which you think can, from your experience, the best tool, uh, and then maybe for uh, Adrian as well that one. I think um, events where people can you can invite people to talk about how the experiences that they have on their streets, because then you you uncover stories and everybody has a story about you know when this almost happened so so as adrian was saying about the statistics that we don't we don't have which are the, the people and dr ian wolf was talking about this as well but we want people to, to bring out those fear you know where people are frightened to cross or where they the journeys they'll hop in the car for with their child thinking that they're safer that way and then and then if you start to get people to open up then you can you can have more of a conversation with them that's more of a two-way conversation rather than just you broadcasting you know this is what you need to do because because of this and I think that's although that's time consuming I think that's in in communities that are close-knit like our one I think that's been that's been very powerful but but there's probably lots of theories on on things that work and I think social marketing in itself is a is a very powerful um tool and, and there are people who are ex way more experts in that area than i am but um but yeah that's that's my my view is just getting people to open up and, and allowing them to talk about their experiences on their own streets is a good start it's almost as if amanda what what that does it, it, it if you like moves the, the 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 benefit of 20 miles an hour from the campaigner to the driver in their own home street and I think this is one of the things we have to make that 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 connection, which which really empowers the change. And it not only empowers the change in getting the 20 mile an hour limit, but it empowers the behaviour change, which we want to see in that driver to think this is about making my street better as well as making other people's streets uh, better. Adrian, can you c come in on that as a, a a a perspective from your experience? Well, I suppose, um, as Amanda's mentioned, social marketing, I should bow to uh, my colleague, Professor Alan Tapper, who is a professor of marketing that knows far more about that than me, but we did write the guidance for the Welsh Government on social marketing. So there are a number of things you need to do in terms of engagement and clear messaging. Clearly, the decision has been, democratic decision has been made in Wales, so it's going ahead. It's not a discussion about, sure, we shan't we, it's going ahead but it's about engaging people so they understand what it's about and you talk about the benefits you can talk about the losses that people might feel but also the benefits that are there to be had and people can see that transparently so the thing i often talk about is you need to have like in, in the context of wells you'd have to have a national conversation we need to have conversation about what is what is the purpose of what we want out of our communities and that's back to rod's wider point about 20 miles an hour is one of the things that can help. It's the tool. Um, but what do we actually want in life? How do we want to live our lives? We don't want to live our lives with fear in terms of letting our children out and all the rest of it. What are we trying to do with our places? What is the difference between movement function and the place function? So I think that you start off with a national conversation or in your village or in your town, you start with that conversation. I think Amanda's talked about that quite eluquently in terms of what Faversham has done and getting people to talk about the concerns that they have because it is the narrative, the telling stories, which brings it all to life and brings people along with you. And of course, one of the things which we've all experienced during lockdown is our own places much more. We've been walking around our, our, our towns and, and villages much more. We've been experiencing, if you like, the benefits from having less traffic and, and, and slower speed uh, uh, traffic and just being in the outside and value it and that's a great launch pad for community discussions about what values we have for those th those places and how we can keep that as as friendly for, for people who want to walk and cycle and just enjoy those public spaces between buildings that that we call roads now i'm where it's uh, 15.53, we're uh, about 10 minutes uh, over. Um, is there anything else which anyone feels wants to cover any of the presenters? Um, Rod, I'll just finish off by um, perhaps mentioning a tiny bit more than I said then. I think one of the things is branding. So in social marketing, branding is really important. Your brand has value. 
your high-end baked beans has more value than your co-op baked beans type of thing. So what people know and trust. So one of the things that Cordedale Council did uh, when they ran out, ran, uh, rolled out their 20 mile an hour program uh, was to have the brand love, love Our Street. And that's really important because it's about street, not road. It was you mentioned the word road and it reminded me of it. So a road is something that is doesn't have any particular sense of um, relationship to you, whereas a street is is something that is yours. You live on this street uh, and you have a community, a uh, street community. Um, we don't talk about road communities. Um, so branding is really important, and I think getting a brand, whether it's in Faversham or whether it's in small settlements across Wales or uh, um, uh, it's in the city of Bristol where we did um, a little bit slower, a whole lot better. Um, these are important things because then those are the heuristics, they are the cues to people go, ah, oh, that's about 20 miles an hour, and people get it. So I think at your peril, forget about the brand. The brand is really important. Yeah, I, 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 and again, I think that's the the discussion we need at national level as well, right? In in, in England, Scotland, we've had that in Wales and and, and Northern Ireland uh, to actually say, look, if this is a value, if this should be the norm, then how do we get it to be uh, the norm and deliver those benefits for all? communities. Um, Sarah, anything from you to finish up on? Um, no, I, I, I'm not sure what I, I, I can add at this point uh, that the other presenters haven't already done very eloquently and probably better than I. Um, but I do feel that if there ever was a time and an opportunity to pilot this on a national level, then this is now. Um, the NHS is going to struggle for a long time and uh, this is a an NHS positive move and the, the, the other side of it is of course that it, the more of us that are out walking and cycling more of the time that also reduces the burden on the NHS as well at a moment when it's absolutely critical to do so. Right. So, so we've all on the clapping for the NHS, but now we just need to move our right foot a little bit less for the NHS. So, Amanda, from your yourself, any final words? Just, just really, um, I think community engagement is really important. Um, I think that we're getting into the situation now where we're going to see impl implementation happen faster. Um, because of the experimental traffic regulation order surrounding um, not just COVID-19, but also getting more people to walk and cycle. But I hope that in that process that, that and there isn't a rush that, that, that means that the community stops being listened to and that, and that we're still as involved with, um, you know, that, that shaping how the scheme evolves um, so that it does actually serve its purpose. And I think that that's, that's, really important because um you know these are our streets and people are very knowledgeable about their own streets and the more that they are engaged with the process early on then the more likely they are to to change their behavior and to comply um so that's that's what i, I sort of that's my takeaway from from the current situation okay thanks man jeff um well i i think echoing many of those points there i hope one good thing to come out of the situation we find ourselves in at the moment is actually going to be that people do think differently about where they live, uh, the society they're in. I was really alarmed at some of the data we had coming back at the beginning of lockdown, which did show the excessive speeds that you've talked about, but the actual numbers was very low. Far, far fewer people were driving excessively fast, but they were driving as a ratio of the people on the road. But that has already gone away. From, from everything I can see. And I, I saw that there was beginning to be an understanding of the link between reducing the load on the NHS by not driving like an idiot. Um, and I just hope that it'll be one of the positives that comes out of it and there will be more community um, initiatives that, of the type that uh, you're talking about here. Okay, uh, and Ian, we can't see you, but... Uh... 
Yeah, Sorry. one final thought. Yeah, just to, as a final thought, um, you shared, Rod, you shared the very powerful figure that the majority of people, I think it was 70 percent, support 20 mile an hour limits. I wonder if you did a poll of the British population and said, what proportion of other people do you think support 20? You'd get a way lower figure. I suspect that most people like the idea, but think they're in the minority in thinking that. So in, you know, to build upon all those really important points that Adrian made about storytelling and branding, which I think 100% important, part of the storytelling should be, most people want this, you are not alone, wanting 20 mile an hour streets to make them more pleasant places like we've all just experienced is also what everybody else wants so that people feel empowered yeah yeah it's it's, it's what uh, adrian and my colleagues uh, alan tap would say plurist pluralistic ignorance right uh, so many people want this but they don't know that others so thank you very much for bringing that up um i think that's about the time uh, to end i i'd really like to to thank all the panelists for giving their time and their their, their expertise and their thoughts to this i I'd, I'd like to to uh thank um uh, landor uh for organizing it and and most of all i'd like to thank the people who listened and 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 who actually uh um registered for for, for this webinar uh and I, I really do hope that we've we, we've informed and we've given some perspectives and by all means if anyone wants any follow-up questions then please go onto our website email me uh, and we'll form them out if we can't answer them we'll get one of the the, 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 the panelists or whoever we can find right to uh, answer any questions which you uh, may have so uh, thank you very much <laughs>